Here we are, so lost together in a period of time when the economies of the world are falling apart. The voices of our seniors herald memories of past catastrophes, encouraging us toward a meaningful, unknown future. I had a general dream, I think, of having a good job, getting married, having a family. Um, that, in general, was what I was wanting, wanting to have. During the Depression years, of course, these were more or less a, a dream without an actuality at that time. Right. Many of us younger people feel overwhelmed by our futures and don't know how to plan for them. Yeah. How did you manage uh, positivity in the face of such difficulty? <clears throat> well, I, I went to school and specialized in accounting. I thought I would get a job at that. But when I left school, it was the Depression was on. So I wanted a job. I looked for a job, and there just were none. So I, <clears throat> I didn't necessarily specialize in accounting. I did advertise myself as an accountant, but I was ready to take a job of almost anything at that time because there just no jobs to be had. Hey, you out there, get ready. Join me and many others on this show. Our host is John Knox. Greetings, I am John Knox. This is Sharing Life, Season 5, Episode Number 1. A Meaningful, Unknown Future. Support for Sharing Life comes from APEC Marketing. To consult their services, go to apecmarketing.com. APEC Marketing, your resource for digital marketing, web, and app development tools. This episode opened with Ben Matlas describing his life during the Great Depression. Mary Thornton also lived during the Great Depression and will give us insight. Following Mary will be Arthur Dixon and then Mays Blanchard. We will conclude with two stories from David Dennison. Well, my name is Mary Thornton. So oh, I did rely a lot on the alphabet to see, to give me courage to carry on in my many downfalls. C for courage, C for consequences. I never made a move until I sized up the situation. And then commitment, if I promised to go somewhere and got a better offer, I never changed it and kept my word. Because that builds your character and people trust you. You can never suspect what's coming. Right. Everything is a big surprise. I was shopping around with my little boy in a walker at a store with a big sign saying, Opening soon. And I knocked on the window and the man came out. I said, What are you opening? He says, A sportswear shop. Oh, that's nice. That we need one. And she says, "Oh yeah, but it's very expensive items." Oh, that's even better. Come on inside and have a look. So I went inside and looked, and he showed me how he was going to lay it out. I said, "It's all wrong. If you mind me telling you, it's all wrong. All your cheap prices should be at the front door." So it doesn't scare people to come in to see a sweater for $150. So he calls the carpenter over and he says, move that over over here and this over there. So he says, do you want a job? I said, yeah, I want a job. He says, it's a dirty job. I don't care. Well, how dirty? Well, I want somebody to come at nighttime and do my floor and the glasses and tidy up the stock. I can do that. So I take the two children after six for an hour or so, and the, the, the staff would be still hanging around, and they say, oh, I wouldn't do that, Mary, if I were you. That's terrible, I wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do that if you paid me. 
So you know what happened? I became the manageress, and they were my servants. Tell me if you liked it. Yeah, that's a good story. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> I'm in charge. I'm the key holder. You're coming on time. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not going home until you're straightening up your mess. So make your job a happy job, no matter how dirty it is. Mary will now tell us about her experience working with the famous people players. It's a, it's the most rewarding job I've ever had because when the mothers bring their young young child, a teenager, they have to be uh, 16 and over. The shy shy little ones, they don't even know how to shake hands, and I say. What is your name? And they say, give me a shake. Hand. Oh, not like that. Oh, what you got? Got a good strong. That's it. My name is John. Oh, there's John. And that's the very beginning. Then the mothers leave us with it in our hands, and it's up to us to make them real. And they takes a while for them to learn something. But once they do, you cannot take it away from them. Then they teach the other one that comes after them. They become the teacher. Now their parents can't believe it. And they have to be the same. At, and they become actors on stage, dancers, some of them singers as well. Nothing amateur about it. It's the training of being chefs, helpers, setting tables, acting on stage, looking after their props. It's so complicated, and I don't know how they remember everything myself. They're punctual. So it's a wonderful reward that we get from them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fascinating. It's really encouraging. And I knew nothing about making uh, puppets, only dr making dresses. But I had to visualize the finished product first in my mind before I could start it. And then once I had it all in my mind, the size and the shape, I could just cut glue and paint for 41 years. Mm. We took a calculation the other not too long ago. Approximately, I made over or created more than four, 22 thousand creatures, from curtains, from Radio City Music Hall in New York, 40 by 60 feet. Unbelievable. That's a lot. Now I sit back and I think, how in the world did I ever have the courage to do it? I couldn't do it today. Ruby will now share with us two different jobs that she had in British Columbia from nearly 80 years ago. When was the last time I was working? Yeah. I don't know. I, I never worked much. Oh, yeah? No. What about, did you ever work in Victoria? In Victoria? Uh, well, I was just a schoolgirl in Victoria. Did you work for anybody famous when you lived in Victoria? Oh, uh, yeah, what was her name now? Emily Carr. Emily Carr, and what did you do for her? Well, I was just sort of a, um, I looked after things sort of, Housework. What was she like to work for? Well, she was okay. She had a sister, older sister, that looked after her and, and uh, uh, made her meals. Oh, no, she was lying in bed all the time. Oh. Mm hmm Yeah. So you did housework for her. What kind of housework did you do? Oh, I don't know. Kind of keep the place clean, I guess. Right. And so, did anything surprising happen when you were doing the housework? Uh, oh, yeah. I First, I let a bird out of the cage, and it went out the window. Out the window? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess the window was open. I don't know. We didn't see the bird anymore. Oh, really? So did Emily get upset? Well, she was a little upset, I guess, but she didn't fire me. Oh, that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. What other memories do you have from living in Victoria? When I was in Victoria? Yeah. Oh, that's a long time ago. Hmm. Uh, can't remember too much. Like when I was in, in school, I took a commercial course knowing that I probably wouldn't be able to get a job. But what happened was we had to move out of Victoria and move to the interior of BC. Right. And so they had to set up uh, an office and uh, I was able to work in the office. I guess I must have been about 17 or 18. Seniors like vote that. the most. We are the least taught. Oh, it's really nice to talk to you. I love the way you... Not everybody can you take go a good there. attitude and just move <laughs> I on. There and I stood up there outside well, there and that I don't worry there. about things. And I made my mm-hmm. thing learn. I'm always listen. pretty happy. And got something done. Yeah. But people were standing up on the balcony looking down at me. Everybody is getting privilege from what my an acorn demonstration day. I Arthur Dixon now tells us of some of his achievements from the acorn. near past and from his garden of many years ago. Arthur continues to be positive and to help others while focusing on his goals. Have you followed through on your gardening aspirations? George Eliot, it is never too late to be what you might have been. More recently, in retirement, uh, I, with my colleague Meg, and we have produced uh, Seasons of Clear Shining, which is a commentary uh, on great hymns of the faith. And, uh, and then Meg also put to trust again on uh, Amazon as an e-book. So here it is. Listen in. This may be the perfect time to start your own little hobby farm and garden. Along with the horses, we had a goat and chickens and uh, uh, dogs and cats, but we had a garden, and I loved the garden and uh, was very fond of doing all kinds of things with vegetables. For instance, I was growing five different kinds of potatoes at one time, um, and during this time also... Uh, I was doing the uh, various things that one has to do in the upkeep of a house. My friend, Mays who is affectionately known as the Acorn Lady. I understand that you're now involved with Acorn Canada. Can you tell me what that's about? Acorn is an association of communities for reform to now. And their main work, that the main work that we do is tenant issues. So like here we did landlord licensing in Toronto. And um, we, we elected the councillor that is here. We actually helped him elected him, got him elected. So because he, wa- he wanted to work with us on landlord lessons, so we got him into power and we worked, we've been continuing working with him for that. We didn't get landlord lessons, but we got something called rent safe. We're doing, we, we were down there with the, the lab, inclusionary housing. We had a whole day last month that we were demonstrating downtown at the Mayor Hoffit City Hall to, to, to carry a recommendation to the, to the mayor to let him know that there is affordable housing is not affordable because the, the providence is 30% of your income. Right. They have put it at 
Let them hire a senior and the rest of my seniors, colleague. How okay, oh, can we afford that? Yeah, this is important. You know, how oh, oh, can we afford something like that? It's just impossible. 30% of your income for housing, you should not be paying less than more than 30% of your income for, for rental housing. So right now it's just two. It's a one bedroom is one thousand five hundred according to the city. That's the that's the price for one bedroom now, and it's, it's out of pocket for most people. It's unaffordable. That is a lot to afford. Yeah. So that's one of the major job for Acorn. And our next major job, Ottawa, where we are working with, is the fair banking. Because the banks own billions and billions of dollars. And what they do, they nickel and dime you. Everything you take, they charge you a dollar. Everything, everything you do in the bank, they charge you. I actually had saved for my retirement. Right. But because of the accident I had with the TTC in 2004, I lost all my money. The so seniors are facing a lot of it, issues. It's a lot of issues we are facing. And it's, as I said, if we don't stand up for ourselves, who is going to? And seniors, they, they think, the horrible thing about it is that we are an aging population. In this past clip, we heard about how Mays takes responsibility for the issues of her community. In the next excerpt, you will hear about how David got his start making cash on the side to needing to be cautious about not letting his dad know how much money he was making. On a Saturday morning, my mom was sat us out the door, and we wouldn't come back until 6 o'clock at night. I was either at the Humber River, Black Creek, the railway tracks, or the brickyard. We, we had a little business at the brickyard. We, we were taking the empties back and, and getting them cold pop. They couldn't leave, and we, needed, we got the money for the, for, the, for the empties, basically what it turned out to be. So that we had more spending money as kids than most adults have, you know, as, as a percentage. Had a job in a butcher shop. Part of my duties were answering the phone and taking orders. And I hated that. Just hated it. And I always got it wrong. Send the people hamburger instead of steak or something. <laughs> oh. Steak? Yeah. They, they, they would order cube steak, which was when you would put it through that thing with all the teeth that diced it up. Yeah. Tenderized it. Yeah. Hamburger was when you put the chunks in and ground it and, and mixed it. Right. I never did figure that out. So the, did you have a favorite between, what was your favorite, hamburger or steak? Filet mignon. Filet mignon. I was thinking My that, boss. Yeah? Would, on a Saturday when we were really busy and you didn't want to break for lunch, we had people lined up out, out, out in the street. He would throw... Come back in and cut the pork tent or the beef tenderloin out and, and, and cook it in, in a pound of butter, and it was so good. Oh man! Right. That's all we ate was steak, well, a big chunk of steak in your hand, and trying to work with the other hand. That was a great, great experience. I had more money in my pocket because I worked Friday night and Saturday. And Sam Revich said to me when I when I first was hired, he said, David. You're going to work like a man, and I'll pay you like a man. I made almost as much money as my father did. Imagine, 14-year-old kid. But I was working Friday night and Saturday, so I had nothing to do with the money anyway. So what did you do with it? Wasted it. I don't remember. I think I bought some weights one time. and You know, just silly, stupid stuff. Should have had a financial planner. to be wealthy now. What are highlights of your retirement? Grandchildren, four grandchildren now. Three of them, unfortunately, are in Nova Scotia, but I enjoy them immensely. It must be so cool, and even these days with video conferencing, how often do you see the grandkids on video conference? Sanders talks to them a lot, but I, I, I don't. It's a bit awkward for me. I not like I never, you know, I never answer the phone. I can't communicate with somebody on the phone. I keep holding the phone. Because I need to see them. I need to see their eyes or, or something or their expression. And it's always been that way. I never remember a time when I didn't 
the one I liked answering the phone. My interviewees all provided me with a new way to look at my world and understand my feelings concerning my life today. They all had different types of work and inspirations, as well as spoken and unspoken difficulty. Take some time to talk to your own family members, young and old. As you listen to their stories, you will be sure to find connections that have the power to fuel you for generations to come and encourage you to achieve a meaningful, unknown future. Each one of my interviewees